Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Institute and to our second presidential elections program. I want to begin by saying that I personally am extremely proud of the job that our founding director, Ambassador Edward Ridgen, has done here at the Institute since we founded it 26 years ago. Today, the Institute is recognized as the third best university-affiliated think tank in the world. And so I want to congratulate the ambassador and congratulate everyone else associated with the Institute. Give them my heartfelt thanks for maintaining excellence here for more than a quarter of a century. Now, part of our success lies with the fact that our fellows focus more on pragmatic results than simply ideological possibilities. They understand that a potential solution is really only as good as its ability to be implemented. With that in mind, the Institute generates results-oriented programs that are applicable to the real world in which we all live. That is certainly true with respect to this program, our presidential elections program, which strives to provide unbiased analyses of the latest trends in presidential elections. The program doesn't promote partisan points of view. Instead, it endeavors to maintain a dispassionate approach to the study of presidential elections. Now, dispassionate, of course, is not a word that describes our next speaker. <laughs> Mary Madeline and James Carville both burn with a deep passion for politics and an even deeper passion for the well-being of our country, even if it is from opposing sides of the political spectrum. And I'm thankful that they have generously agreed to serve as the honorary directors of today's program. Each of them is a successful political consultant who has helped candidates win the White House. Mary played important roles in four Republican presidential campaigns, including senior positions with the winning 1988 campaign of George H.W. Bush. Four years later, James managed Bill Clinton's campaign that unseated President Bush and coincidentally marked my own involuntary retirement from public service. <laughs> Their story became part of the political lore after a romance between them heated up while they were working on opposite sides of that 1992 presidential election. Despite their mutual affection, don't think for one minute that either one of them ever pulled their punches about their spouse's candidate. Here's what James once said about my good buddy, George H.W. Bush. He reeks of yesterday. <laughs> when I see an old calendar, I see George Bush's face on it. I suppose I'll never forget that one, James. In the Bush camp, Mary was equally effective. If we cannot believe anything he says about the past, she said of Clinton, how can we believe anything he's going to say about the future? Not bad, Mary. Hard-hitting rhetoric is the mother's milk, of course, of politics. And both Mary and James employ unique and effective uses of the English language, even if James' speech is sometimes tinged with that coon-ass accent. <laughs> Each of them has mastered the political art of saying what they mean and meaning what they say. And each of them are Shakespeare's of the quip, brilliant in both scope and simplicity. James in 1992, quote, it's the economy, stupid, became a new age political axiom that reflected the ages old wisdom that the three most important campaign issues in any presidential election are the economy, the economy, and the economy in that order. Mary is just as pithy and poignant. Her rule number one, 
Never make anyone uncomfortable in your home, even morons. <laughs> That's good advice to anyone and not just to politicians. It's more than clever remarks, though, that make Mary and James successful. Both of them combine innate intelligence with savvy street smarts. Both of them are extremely hardworking, and both know how to work out all the angles. As a result, they have reached the top of their profession, and we are fortunate to have them with us today. Their conversation will be moderated by their friend and fellow political consultant, Karen Rove Johnson, Sorry, Karen Johnson Rove. <laughs> that was a demotion. That was a demotion, Karen. <laughs> Who helped guide yet another candidate into the White House. In 2000, she assisted George W. Bush's candidacy by, by working with campaign chairman Don Evans, campaign manager Ken Al Joe Albaugh, and political director Ken Melman. Today, Karen is founder and president of Infrastructure Solutions, Inc., an Austin-based governmental affairs firm that represents clients before the Texas legislature, the United States Congress, and various state and federal agencies. And if any proof is needed that politics is a small world, Karen is married to Carl Rove, the architect of George W. Bush's presidential campaigns who was an honorary co-director of our last year's presidential elections program. Welcome as well to Carl, who's here in the audience and will serve as substitute moderator for Jonathan Carl of ABC News on this afternoon's panel that examines the 2020 presidential election. So thanks to you, Carl, for helping out. And the fact that you and, and Jonathan spell your name, both spell your name K-A-R-L is a, is, a, is a help to us because we didn't have to make as many changes in the program. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a special pleasure and honor for me to introduce three of the best political consultants in the business and three people who tell it like it is. Mary Madeline, James Carville, and Karen Johnson Rowe. <laughs> Me to sing. Go ahead, sing. On now. Ah, technology, a wonderful thing. Uh, well, first of all, we would like to thank the Baker Institute for hosting us here today. And I would like to give a special thank you to Secretary Baker for all of your service. You have served many presidents as chief of staffs, as members of their cabinet. You even got to chair the wonderful Florida recount, which I think you weren't counting on at the time, but you did a superb job. And I just want you to know, really and truly, because of your wisdom, your leadership, and your steady hand on the tiller, we really want to thank you for all of your public service. So. And to James. A huge congratulations to your LSU Tigers, uh, who beat the I, I, have, I, I haven't noticed anything lately, but... Yes. <laughs> Look, we're going to beat Oklahoma. That's got to make everybody in Texas happy, huh? That's the face of happiness. <laughs> now, the face of unhappiness the previous Saturday is when your Tigers beat my Aggies 50 to 7. James, I'm just going to tell you need to pass on to Coach O. When you get, you know, 
20, 30 points ahead, you can go ahead and put the second or third string in. <laughs> so I brought just a little something to show you how I felt about how the Tigers beat the Aggies. <laughs> And yes, there is a backstory about why I have James's face on a popsicle stick, but you're going to have to meet me in a bar much later to hear about this. Karen, did I mention we beat Texas too? So we equal opportunity ass kickers, if okay. you know what I mean. And he, that's definitely made amends in my book. Um, so Secretary Baker mentioned the 1992 election. And so in order to sort of get, get myself prepared, uh, I rewatched The War Room this week. Uh, the War Room is a fascinating documentary about then Governor Bill Clinton's presidential campaign. And if you've never seen this, obviously everyone in here is a political junkie or you wouldn't be here at this event. This documentary is political porn. I mean, it is absolute political porn. It is so engaging. And I think back, and James, I, I just really have to ask you about how this came about, because on the surface, when you say, let's mic up the raging Cajun, uh, a roughly 15-year-old looking George Stephanopoulos, who is director of communications, and bring in a guy with a camera and film a presidential campaign, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so tell me about the impetus, whose idea it was, how it ever got green-lighted. Give us the backstory on the war room. Absolutely. Well, first of all, every New Orleanian has to come in and say the same three words. Thank you, Houston. For anybody that doesn't know what that means, ask a Houstonian, and they'll explain it to you, OK? <laughs> but everybody knows. Uh, you know. Before I get started, I, I have a simple rule I always tell my students, and that is you should always strive to be the dumbest person in the room. If you're ever in a room and you're the smartest person in it, get the hell out. There's nothing for you to learn. So in the past six weeks, I've been to the Yale Political Union, to the Oxford Debating Society, and the Baker Institute at Rice. There's no danger I'm not the dumbest person in the room. Glad to be that. We'll feast off of it. Mr. Secretary, it's a big honor to be part of this program. Thank you very much for inviting us, sir. Uh, then myself, you know, I love college. I mean, the best four years of my life was spent as a sophomore at LSU. Uh, <laughs> I, before I get started, by the way, the quote about President H.W. Bush about the calendar, that was a pretty good quote because our message was we were, we were trying to be the change and trying to be something different, and I'd forgotten it, but when you read it out, I'm like, man, I was on the money back then, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, so the war room, D.A. Pennybacker, who is a legendary documentary maker, came and was going to do a documentary on the 1992 Democratic Convention. And then he said, look, we would like to do a documentary on the campaign. And we kicked it around and said, okay, you can do it, but we can take anything out that we want. All right, we, we have the final, we can't put anything in, but we, and, and as it turned out, we didn't take anything out. And it, it, he only filmed it for, people think he was there the whole campaign. He was there for three or four days. And when you watch it, it's, it, it's a really interesting part, part of filmmaking. There are no voiceovers, there are no chirons. He, he, he drives the entire narrative with the people in it. So there's not in, you know, a group of you know, rebels met in Little Rock, Arkansas, at a stage and insurgents, none of that. So in, it was one of the, the best things I ever did in my life, and every high school civics teacher loves us because that's one class they don't have to prepare for. <laughs> And every college professor, I always show it one time. Hell, I ain't got to get ready for this one. We'll just let her rip, baby. <laughs> but that's how, that's how it came to pass. And I, I think if I look back, in, now you're not serious if you don't have a war room. Everybody in the world has a war room for anything that they do. And it's just become part of the culture. And so it was a... And then Mary, she was great in it, I thought. She, they, they got her, and then, huh, you, were, you were singing. Out we there. have girls now uh, who are 21 and 24 that Karen has largely raised. And all they ever say about this, mother, that hair. 
<laughs> that you look like Tammy Wynette. I said, yes, I wish I had that much hair. I, can I thank Ambassador, of course, and Secretary Baker and Mrs. Baker. We're so honored to be here in that Carl is here with his beloved bride. And thank you, Karen, for doing this. Karen's been working so hard, Carl finally said, don't, you've been knowing them for 30 years or longer. I've known Karen longer than I've known James. So they're just gonna talk, so you don't, but you studied so hard, thank you very much. We've been knowing them so long that when our little girl who goes to LSU, who also almost didn't get out of there her sophomore year, she, no, her, her freshman year, she lost her ID. She was there for three days, lost her ID, her driver's license, her checkbook, her credit cards, and fell asleep on a pile of red ants. And I'm freaking out because I didn't want her to go to her daddy's alma mater. He goes, sugar, I think there was some alcohol involved in this. <laughs> so um, anyway, so this is a carvel. She is a total carvel. When she was four years old, she came it was at Christmas time, and she put on Karen's chinchilla coat, and she goes up to her father, and she goes, this is the floor. I'll leave you to figure out the ceiling. <laughs> and she's still like that, so thank you very much, and you can pay the bills. <laughs> can I say about the war room? Yes, I did love that, but I also want to say about uh, It's the Economy, Stupid. He, he is the Zen master sound bites because he's very ADHD and he has the attention span of a gnat, which is, the, which I love, bursts of clarity. But before James, we were, when you were saying that, there was James A. Baker, jobs, jobs, jobs. And I'm a Yankee from Chicago and we don't never talk like the way y'all talk, which I love. And the first person I ever said, and this is when I fell in love with you, Calling, being called ugly by whoever it was is like being called ugly by a frog, which is a big, it's a huge introduction to me of how to communicate. It was, and that's James A. Baker, so he stole everything he knows from you, and he's terrified uh, of I've you. always been, uh, right, I, I relish my stupidity. <laughs> oh. I have so much to learn from Secretary Baker. He has nothing to learn from me, so I just sat at his feet and absorbed the wisdom. <laughs> he, he, actually, you did give after that campaign. I'm not making this up, am I? I could be. I'm at that age where you can live without sex, but not your glasses. Um, <laughs> didn't you give Baker the whole credit for the campaign after that that, yeah. that everybody else ran out on? Well, what I, I've said, and I told the secretary, there's only three people that I've ever met that intimidated me: Barbara Bush, George Mitchell, and Jim Baker. Those are, I literally have been a pretty loosey-goosey guy, but those are three people that you never loosey-goosey around. <laughs> no. you know. I've got to tell you, there is one scene in the movie that is absolutely my favorite, and it really is indicative about even when you can compete against each other, you can keep a civil tone. And it takes place after the third debate, and all of you know that after a presidential debate, the senior members, they head into the spin room, right? So it's Mary's job to get in there and talk about how 41 won the debate, Governor Clinton was wrong on this, James is out there. So, I mean, Mary's just slugging and it's, you know, adrenaline running. And the camera then shows the two of them walking together out of the auditorium. And James looks over to Mary. And this is one of the many things I love about James. When James smiles, James smiles with his entire face. James does not give a half smile. And he leans over and he gives Mary that Cheshire grin. And he says, when this is all over, pack your bags, we're going on a trip. <laughs> and Mary, I don't remember that. Mary on camera melts. She has gone from a firebrand in there for 41 to Ah, that's one woman's interpretation of an indie film. <laughs> it's out there, it's on Amazon. That's I'm not how I remembered you. what I still call the recent unpleasantness. In fact, that night at the election night at the Houstonian, I was with um, Mr. Secretary Baker came in with his crew with six weeks to spare, like you could save that sinking campaign. And we did lose, you didn't win. And Perot helped us lose, by the way. I was with your, the Baker people, with Janet and, and Margaret, 
and you think I'm nice? How many times did I call you and say the most, and every one of your family members, he's one of eight, I called all of his sisters, and I disowned the entire family because Clinton won Louisiana on top of everything else. I, I was just thinking, you're missing a Houstonian. I actually lived in the Houstonian in 1989 as I led Fred Hoffines to like 42% of the vote <laughs> running for mayor Houston. So, and, you know, when you do these things, they always like relish all the great things you did. They, they look like, well, all of the ones you lost <laughs> way down there. <laughs> that was that was not my finest hour. <laughs> James, you have done a lot of races, and in every race, whether you're running for mayor, governor, but most especially president, there are what I like to call forced errors and unforced errors. A forced error is when the campaign or the candidate screws up. Like whoever thought it was going to be a great idea to put a helmet and Michael Dukakis in a tank. Right? Whoever gave Yang a can of Ready Whip and got, you know, young boys on, on the ground for him to spray the Ready Whip, that's a candidate error. And then you get what I call unforced errors, like when it comes out several days before the election that 43 has previous decades, decades previously had gotten a DWI with John Newcomb up in Kitty Bunkport. That's unexpected. But regardless, it's up to the strategist and the campaign to recover, whether it's the candidate's fault or whether it's from outside sources. So James, in all the campaigns you've done, talk to me about some, some of the most unbelievable things that you've had to overcome either by a forced error or unforced error. Well, I mean, obviously <laughs> the entire Lewinsky thing was <laughs> a forced error, <laughs> to, to, to say least. And look, I think Carl would attest to this too. And I, When you're dealing in politics, you're dealing with human beings. These people are not gods or anything. They're, they're more risk takers than most of us. They, they, they dare to fail publicly more than we do. But when you're dealing with human beings, they're going to say, you know, we, and everybody's had this, we'd have a, a, a perfect event scheduled, and then Clinton would go up to the rope line. And then that was the end of that. And, and that but that's going to happen all the time. You, 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 people get into this, you got to understand. And, and the, the candidates are human beings, the, the, the staff are human beings, the, the everybody is. And all you're trying to do is to the best you can get the best out of human beings with the fewest errors. But you're right. And, and, in some of them, and I'm looking at these Democrats now, it's like, are you really trying to win? Okay, if you're having a debate and you're talking about letting that terrorist in Boston vote from his jail cell, you're not trying to win the election. You're trying to do something else. And that's what befuddles me. I, I can understand that you make a mistake if you try to catch the ball when it slips through your hands. It's another thing if you don't even put your hands out to try to catch it. <laughs> All right, and, and that's a very important thing to remember here. These are, they might be bigger than life, they might be powerful, they might have different things that happen to them, and they might be famous, but at the end of the day, if, if you're looking across at, at, at President Clinton or, or either the President Bushes or either, either President Obama, you, you're looking at a human being. That, that's a big thing to remember. So you're always going to have that kind of stuff, or just, you know, people are going to go and say, get off message, and but that 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 happens, and you just and, and, you know you get something, and then you deal with it, and then you you you're going to get something else. It's uh, you know, there's a set of uh, of General Grant. He had four o'clock in the morning courage. You could tell him that they turned the flank, and he'd just be okay, deal with it. You just if you're going to be in that business, you got to deal with adversity, and to some extent. In our business is the same thing. It's adversity happens every day. Absolutely. Mary, do you have any but, good yeah, stories? Yeah, but I, and we were talking about this last night. I am so grateful that we did politics when we did it with the people for whom we served. It was an honor, it was a privilege, it was noble. I mean, imagine, Poppy every day, 41 every day would say, duty on our country. You can't say, that's not woke, you can't say that now. And it was so, when I, I 
what was we thought was so negative then, Poppy Bush called me, I thought this is what I thought you were gonna talk about, quoting me, called me from Air Force One to, because the White House had fired me and he called me to unfire me. And he said, keep fighting, but just clean it up a little bit. Because I had said, Bill Clinton is a, no, I said it, maybe it was in that film, I said, I never said Bill Clinton was a pot-smoking, draft-dodging prevaricator. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with that? I said, I never said it, it was very Nixonian. But the, <laughs> the actual issue was, he thought I said he was a fornicator. I said, no, it's a prevaricator. He said, you can't call him a liar, so I call him a prevaricator. But that, so we got, I got fired for that. Remember, and so think of what everybody says to, about each other now. It is a, and thank you for contributing to this institute, because politics is a noble profession. It's never going to go away, because human beings are never going to go away, as Thucydides Thucydides said, war is always going to be the same. We have to have more respect for the whole system. And I, and they, it's, and that has a lot to do with the media and what gets covered and all that. But it also has to do with the careerism that has infused our business. When Karen did the recount that Secretary Baker ran, you didn't, there wasn't some bureaucracy. She lined up and Air Force full of planes and got them to Florida overnight and got everybody situated and did all other things. You just did, and you had bosses like Mr. Baker, the Secretary Baker, it's like, just get it done. Now it's such a, it's so bifurcated and teeny weeny and 140 characters and no message. I don't know what the message, and I, and I feel sorry for you. I am not attacking you. I feel sorry for you in the same way you didn't feel sorry for me when our party was going through this transition. I know what this feels like when you have half your party is Jurassic Park and the other half is Stalin. I don't even know who these people are. I, it's hard if you're a regular, normal, liberal, southern, white, man of a certain age, Democrat who came of age during segregation. I know why he's a liberal, and I know what he's what he thinks the role of government should be. I don't see a lot of that from either side anymore, unless you watch Carl. I said I keep the sound off all the time unless Carl comes on and says something, and he always says something smart. But when we served, it was an honor, a privilege, noble, and I wish young people. And it was fun. It was so much fun. We had so much fun even though that campaign wasn't fun. But young kids now, I want them to be in politics and work on campaigns and not turn into what it's turned into, where it's us versus them. It's just, you don't even, I'm being cliche about this, but it really just shocks me, even in my own home. One of my daughters is a liberal, the other one is the LSU, I don't know what she, she is. Man, no, she she's is she's we're, at the, she, we're at the next party. No, not the political party, Daddy. No, the, the KD party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Sigma Nu party or something. Isn't that the party she's interested in? Okay, let me tell you something that makes my point. First of all, I can't even talk around the other one. Okay, Mom, you can't say that. I can't say what? You can't say, I don't know what I can't say anymore, so I just don't okay. say anything around her. I don't know what the, I mean, and it has to do with this, era where we, our language, different, we speak in different tongues and we read different papers and we get different news sources and we're increasingly clustered. And if there was ever a time we need more nobility and back in politics, it's as we're clustering. And I, this goes to, and then I'm gonna shut up. What Secretary Baker was saying about results, this is my prediction for who's gonna come out of your party in our future of our party. Results, people are, they, they're, they don't, people don't read Twitter, they're not addicted to it. I don't know how to do it anyways, or Facebook or any of that kind of stuff. And if you're over 30 and like a glass of wine at night, you shouldn't have a Twitter account either. You shouldn't have any of that kind of stuff. But th this, this conversation that we're having at this paradigmatic shift from, a, from an infrastructure that's predicated on in, in industry to information age tools, we are not using our information age tools 
properly. And this is the first generation, or we're using it for efficiency, but this is the first generation wholly raised in with information age tools. So we need them in politics. We don't need to do things faster. We need to do things differently and better that show results, that have results that you can measure, which is one of the problems with giant big government. You can't even measure anything. So that is my, and I'm just saying, and, and then I'm, I'm actually going to brag about him on this, of, the, of Nancy Pelosi's majority makers, 31 seats, those are his recruits. Like Carl, who always understood everything from redistricting to state offices to everything, how the whole system works, he and his merry band of ADHD geniuses went out and found these guys that are now do not want to they want to lead the party. They want to show results. That's what they got elected for. So I'm, I'm not attacking you. I feel really bad for you. And I, if I can ask him a question, because we don't talk about this at home. You think we're so civil? Have you ever been to our house we talk about politics? Never. All right. I would like to know what is happening. What, just tell me Just tell me what to look for. Well, or all of us, what to I, look for. When you do these events, you try to do one thing. You try to be honest and pleasant, all right? Because we don't really. However little you might think I think of Trump, you have no idea, okay? So I'll just leave it at that, okay? I, I, we don't, I, I don't need to expand. Did I, I say I Trump? I I'm, said I'm Trump. getting I to the Trump. point, I'm getting to the point. I actually believe this, and this is a frightening thing to say. I think the future of this republic rests in the hands of Democratic primary voters. I really do. Because I, I, the Republicans are not going to change, and we got... Now... That, that's a, but I, let me tell you, these voters are really serious. I, I talked to a friend of mine who just did focus groups in Iowa, and all they were talking about, well, I don't know if I can vote for this person because they can't win. The, the, the pragmatism that I see is really pretty remarkable. Now, I don't know, because to tell you what happens, you see, go look at UK. I was over there. Boris Johnson doesn't know what he's doing. They don't like him. He can't comb his hair. He is going to win because Jeremy Coburn has made himself totally unacceptable with all this goofy left-wing stuff. If David Miliband would have been the chairman of the Labor Party, they, they, they went over half the seats. So it's this idea that people have that they're just these massive rifts in politics that's not true. It matters who you nominate, and it matters what they come up with. So, uh, and I think it's this thing, and I have no idea. Carl had a column, Jonathan Martin, the same thing. I was started thinking the same thing. We always thought, he said, oh, it's going to be a broken convention. No, it never is. Whatever the chances are, I think most people I know would agree there's a better chance than not that we go to Milwaukee without a nominee. All right, I, I don't, I, I'm not a delegate person, but people that are would, would tell you that this is very possible. I, and so I don't know, but I, I do have this, this optimistic, and, and you know, it might be unfounded, but I think these voters are dead serious. And, and if you look at Senator Warren, who more than most of you in this room, I actually, well, I thought she had the most remarkable biography maybe of anybody ever run for president. And Houston played a big part in her biography. And I think that her general critique of modern America is pretty spot on. Then she just walks over, just follows Bernie and Jeremy Coburn right over the cliff. And the voters know that. It's not like, it's not like you have a bunch of Democrats sitting there trying to figure out who is, and anybody in this business will tell you, Democratic voters know that. There's no one that's ever done a focus group, or you did in Iowa. These are supposedly the most liberal people and why we have the Iowa caucuses, and it's, it's all, you know, but 62, 64 to 32, they want somebody that can win as opposed to somebody they agree with on most things. And, and I think, I, I fundamentally believe this, I literally believe that our future, in a large part, rests 
with Democratic primary voters who uh, are heavily older African Americans, union members, college, you know, rice faculty, people that vote in a, in a Democratic primary. But I do have a sense that, 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 that this undertaking is being taken pretty doggone seriously. And I think I could back and that up. That makes the point. It's a catch-22. One of the speakers last night, and I didn't know this until he said it, Hillary spent her billions of dollars in her campaign, 75%, 25% on policy and 75% on Trump's character. Say what you want about Trump. You can measure the jobs reports, and you can measure all of There's measurements, and there's results. They're, I don't know what their... But I don't know what their message is, just hating Trump or just trying to beat Trump with what? You have to beat him with something. Now you're two ostensible front runners next to Joe, who I think is going to be your nominee, are fighting about who got paid more by which corporation 40 years ago. Does anybody here, I take it there's some liberals here, does that bother you? Is that going to be vote dispositive or vote determinative for you? One thing that Secretary Baker knows, and you know, and Carl knows, and Karen, voters think it's about them, and you guys, you're acting like it's a, some Twitter people, or I'm not a criti being critical, I'm just curious about I, this, because I, 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 I agree I'm with you. I'm saying I don't know of anybody in the middle of this that doesn't think the voters are serious, and I think the, can the candidates have not been that good so far. I, I really do. I'm not being, I'm not like, I'm a, and I have no idea how Bloomberg is going to deal with the China problem. But that's going to be, they're going to have to deal with that. Because he, I saw him, he was on the interview, and Margaret Hoover asked him about it, and people that have, he's going to, people, there's a lot for people to deal with. I do not know how this is going to end. I, I, I already said it, I'm for Michael Bennett. Because if 20 people with 2020 vision says you got, Shaving cream on the earlobe? You got shaving cream on the earlobe. Well, if everybody I know in respect comes up and starts the conversation by saying, James, you know, Michael Bennett would be the best president, then why the hell am I not for him? Probably not going to win. Doesn't matter. But why not? But why not try the best if you're trying something? But, but whatever happens, I think that these candidates now understand that they were chasing something. In, in, and, I, and I tell these people, I am not a moderate, okay? I am a liberal. I am not a leftist, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I believe in progressive taxation, not confiscatory taxation, all right? I believe in, you know, helping people get an education. I don't believe in blanket student loan forgiveness. It's one of the dumbest ideas. I got in an argument with my oldest daughter about that. But, because she, she's a leftist that argues with a liberal daddy, but that's okay, too. It's a, a, lot, a, lot, it's a lot of that that goes up. But at any rate... Talks to you. At, at any rate, she talk, <laughs> at, at any rate I, I think that what's really... What's happening in a Democratic Party is uncertain, highly relevant to the future of the country, and I don't have any... I think it'll end okay because I think the voters' heads are in a good place, but I don't know that, and I'm not sure we're going to get to Milwaukee. And boy, and let me tell you, everybody in the world is going to be there. It's going to be it's going to be a wild ride. But there are plenty of things I'm worried about. But I think the our voters have to settle this thing out for the rest of the country. Let me can I substantiate this as something less like if verbiose? John Anzalone is here. Is he already? He's probably on the. Well, he's on today, right? He's on today. Okay, he and did the John Bell Edwards race in Louisiana, and re and Trump kept coming in there, and everybody said, "Oh my God, oh my God, these rallies!" And what I said, and I called Rush. I said, "This is he's just he he's people will come to his rallies, but this governor is pro life, pro gun, pro military, balanced the budget." He did a lot for education, and you know what the voters said afterwards? Yeah, we like Trump, but he was wrong on this. And he could, John Bell could show results for all of this. And I think you got a little crazy after the runoff, but that was our fault too. But J John is a living testament to this. These races that are winning are, are sensibly results-oriented, polite, not... What are you laughing at? I know, I'm just laughing about it. I'm thinking about Anzalone. I gave Anzalone his first job in politics in 1988. He was my political director in New Jersey. 
and I was calling, I said, Angela, come here. You pro labor? He said, Yeah, I love labor. I said, Good, labor your ass out there and get me a cup of coffee. <laughs> Remember that? So the John becomes one of the most prominent posters in the Democratic Party, lives in Alabama. So, you know, that it's always good. I always like my posters not to be to be out in the rest of the country. Which, by the way, speaking of civility, one of John's best friends is Bill Canary, who was George H.W.'s John Anzalone. And it, and there, I mean, this is people do not, in the real world, hate and are, and are despairing, and are, or, nor are they, do they want to be, and maybe this is the wrong way to say it, they don't want to spend obsessive amounts of time on politics, they care about football, their kids, their church, their community, all this, this form po- We're weirdly obsessive about an increasingly narrow, irrelevant, distracted topic as far as voters are concerned. I, don't, I just want to repeat across the land what you guys did in Louisiana, and I am, I didn't, I voted yeah, I for about Kentucky, time. too, I was very involved oh. there. I, I, beat, I beat Andy Brashear's daddy. Well, that was a different, we're going to have a fight about that. I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm, no, because that, I don't want to cast aspersions. Right. Okay. No, that's a different thing. I'm not bragging about you. I'm talking about my point about, or Angeloni, that the reason that, that a blue guy could win in a ruby, ruby red state is because he had results. Voters are... Here, they are, this is the rubber hits the road. This is not like when we started perception is reality. Reality is reality. The cost of education, the cost of drugs, the curriculus in, in education, immigration, all these are really imploding on people's lives. And they don't really care about these character attacks. And weirdly, I think Trump and his idiot savant way got that. I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and as long as I'm delivering, and if he keeps producing jobs reports like he did this week, I, I, I don't, you're just gonna at some point, you're gonna have to get back to no. talking about a way, or stop talking about Medicare for all, right. or. There, there, there are plenty of things that we can talk about. It, what? It, it, first, it, first of all, change the way this country is going. I, I mean, literally, we can't take another four years of this. If, if I had to, if Biden came up and said, I'm going to serve four years, I, I, I'm going to have a somewhat, I'll, I'll, I'll pledge to put 25% of my cabinet members would be Republicans, some kind of a unity government just to get us off of this, I would be for it. You, you can say, you take an economy growing at 2%, you stick a trillion dollars worth of stimulus in it, and you get an economy at 2%, okay. And by the way, we want to talk about the economy, what do you think the economy is booming? You think it's booming in Houston or is it booming in Tyler, Texas? You think it's booming in Dallas or you think it's booming in, in Amarillo? I mean, most all of the growth that we have is from urban areas. If you go to, you go to Tennessee, you go, there's Nashville and there's the rest of Tennessee. And that's, that's what's happening. You, you go to rural, What's happened to rural America, I, I can understand. In the Democrats, you know, this is one of the things I always point out. There, there's, there's some say we just, you know, we should double down on our coalition, the young, the urban, the diverse, the, this, that. I, I, that's a good idea, but I just have one little thing I want to point out to you. 18% of the United States elects 52 senators. Get that through your head. 18% of the country elects 52 out of 100 senators. Well, you're not going to do that with your plan in your own backyard, with your own coalition. You have to try to be a majoritarian political party. So everybody says, well, Trump's got 42 locked down. Good, let's get to 58. When I was in politics, 42 wasn't a great number. I got that for Lloyd Doggett. <laughs> okay? I, 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 so it, 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 there's a big struggle within the party about should we be pure and, and, and more enthusiastic or we should take a, sit back and take a broader view of the world. It seems to me, it, by the way, I'm a rural white. What's wrong with me? Sure. <laughs> I, okay, I, I grew up in the car mill. You can't be anymore. We, had, we, didn't, we didn't have an intersection. We had one stop sign. We had to cut off meet the levee. But, 
in a Democrat, it, it, it's up to them. My point to you today is it really rests. <laughs> And you know, most of you are probably lifelong Republicans or don't know even, some of you might not know very many Democrats. Let me tell you, in my humble opinion, this decision is going to have a profound impact on this country going outward. See, and, I just want to say the essence of that message, and I was, despite how you dressed it up, put lipstick on a pig, the, still the core of that message was we have to beat Trump, the country can't take this anymore record high employment of all sectors, best jobs reporting. I'm not even going to go through all those numbers. I, but I also want to say this, since you brought it up, urban centers are producing wealth. They're also producing the most inane, counterproductive policies from, from whatever they're doing in San Francisco that allows people to live on the streets like animals. How is that progressive? Or Chicago, my hometown where children are, I mean, every, name me a city that uh, an urban area outside of Texas, or you know, that's, there's some places balanced. <laughs> name, name me a state or, that's primarily democratic or liberal and has instituted these policies in the last decade. You want 20 of them? Start with Boston, Washington, New Orleans, Houston, Miami, Denver. Uh, by the way, the, so the argument that you hear is that no one wants to live in San Francisco, but the housing prices are astronomical. So let me get a rice economist on this. <laughs> How is it that no one wants to live there and it costs so much to live there? I'm confused. It's called supply okay? and I don't demand, have a honey. talk radio mentality, so I've got to ask the follow-up question. So clever. This is called clever misdirection. It's called supply and demand. <laughs> Yeah, well, but so if no one so wants to live there, why is there such a demand for housing? That's the, I will, if, if we're going to argue, but okay. we're not going to argue that. I am going to wrap this up because I know, John, <laughs> no, no. Let's okay, get I've, got, I've got one last question to get in, but I've, I've got my timekeeper over here, so I'm trying to keep us on track. Um, James, I completely agree with you about the Democratic voters. And I also agree with you that I think because of the way the Democrats have this apportionment system for delegates that you very, very well might go into a brokered convention. And so the question is, it's gonna come to the superdelegates who are gonna pick the nominee. And so do they pick the person who is leading in delegates or do they uh, pick it, maybe a more establishment? And I in that yeah. case, what are the odds that all of the others come and get behind them? So, in other words, let's let's say it's Biden. Is Sanders going to support a Biden ticket? Is Warren going to support a Biden ticket? Is, uh, yeah. Are, are they going to? Well, first of all, it's not. It's if it's Biden, then the whole Jill Stein, who was 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 a Russian agent, by the way. If you just look at the, I'm, I'm serious. Just all you got to do is look, Google photo General Flynn Vladimir Putin. But who's at the table? Jill Stein. But that could very, look, it, it, this is my view. The Republican Party that I ran against when I was doing political consult, it no longer exists. But you can call it the Republican Party. That is not the Republican Party that I ran campaigns against. All right? And by the way, I, I, the Democratic Party may not exist in its current form. I, I think it will, because I go back to, I think our voters are pretty serious about this. But this is a this is an uncertain and frightening thing that we're gonna we're, we're gonna get flushed out here, and it's not, you know, usually you you a spokesman for the party, and oh everything's gonna be fine, we're gonna take it, we got this much here, and if you look at the, the demographic changes, and you look at the map, and you can see what we're doing, I don't think anything is a given in U.S. politics, and the the one thing if I leave you with one thought, is this. The levels of voter engagement are so astronomical, we have no historical comparison. In 2018, we had the highest off-year turnout since women were granted the right to vote. Okay, think about that. So uh, Michael McDonald, who's at the University of Florida, for some reason, the default expert on turnout. And I think he's pretty good. There were, I think, 136 million people that voted in 2016. 
we're looking at somewhere close to 160 million right now. That's astronomical. Anybody that thinks that they can take a poll or they can project, because the levels of engagement that we have, and you, anybody that does focus groups come back and say, man, they, you know, it's usually we'd say never talk about strategy. You just tell about what you're going to do for people. The, the average person is talking about, well, I can't be, I, I can't be, if, 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 if she's Medicare for all, and I can't do that because the, the, the Trump and them are going to beat the heck out of it. And, you know, I, I got in an argument with these leftists, and it's, it polls 71 percent. First of all, as soon as you say something, I said, I can tell you one thing. Y'all are a lot smarter than me, but the other side gets to play, too. You're not the only one. You just don't go out and say, we're going to do this, because the other side's going to get to play. And that, that is going to go nowhere. And the, but the voters already know it. And these other candidates see that. They see that Warren was shooting up and then did this Medicare for all, and then it's gone flat. I mean, we're watching a real-time experiment. We're watching a real-time, we're, we're, we're living in something real-time, and we're living in it with really engaged, really involved voters. And that's what makes the prediction industry, and people want to know, you know, if, if I go to the best doctor in Houston and he gives me an exam and says, you know, James, you're going to drop dead in nine months and three days. And nine months and three days later, I drop dead. Is that a good doctor? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, well, can we figure something out to you know, get, get nine years as opposed to nine months out of this deal? And so people come to me and say, who's going to win? Yeah, honestly, I don't know. Because we sat, we sat there and, and everybody, and, we, and we've concluded that no one can win. Which, of course, somebody's going to. I don't know how we're going to get there, but we're going to have a nominee. I have no idea who it's going to be. I'm being very, and I'm supposed to be, I'm, I come here, with, uh, and Mary, I'm supposed to be some kind of authority. I don't know. I'm scared to death, okay? Really, I'm shaking. You don't look like it, but I, internally, I'm, I'm very afraid. Can I, I know we're short on time, but this is why I love them, and I can close on a civil note. Two, and you're going to be studying this this afternoon. Two points, and one I'll just dismiss. The, the distracting issue of eradicating the electoral college, stupid, dumb process, okay? But the other his, history-making thing that's going to happen here, and it goes to all the points we've been making, it this sort of con conflates them. It's really not a national campaign. It's a state-by-state. State. People forget this, unless you're of a certain age. This, the way this, the apples fall, Iowa, New Hampshire, that started with Jimmy Carter and famously George H.W. Bush in 1980. Before that, Iowa was nothing. So now, and the, he got the big mo and blah, blah, blah. But then that became like a rule of politics. Whoever wins Iowa or New Hampshire, you gotta, well, we're gonna have different victors in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada, these are state contests with active voters, and the other side does get to play, because what Trump is turning out are people who haven't voted for a long time. But I don't know, you, you previously disagreed with this, whoever comes out of Iowa, that you just sucked all the oxygen out of the air. I don't think that's true in this media age. If you have four different, I mean, this is your topic for this afternoon. How does, why the Electoral College, please bring this home. And how do we, how does, preserving the Electoral College, how is this going to change presidential politics and presidential elections? Which, by the way, thank you again, this is the only institute in the country that studies presidential elections. And you see all these beboppers on TV about whom Donna Brazil, one of my best friends, said, boy, all you have to do to be a pundit today is having voted once. So you can only watch Carl or Don or Jay. I mean, nobody knows what they're talking about, and it's being preserved here. And that's a piece of history that's about to change this right. front runner locking, sucking all the oxygen out of the early states to prevail again. And the reason I bring this up is because Mini Mike is, everyone thinks he's going to do a repeat of Giuliani, but if he comes, I don't, I'm not predicting him at all. I'm predicting Joe Biden. I'm just saying there is a tangible, measurable reason to not be able to predict what's going to happen. Right. So I, I want you to just move out for the I, next I, couple I of think, months. I think that the experts 
to the extent that people think I'm one, or Carl, or Karen, or Mary, or whatever, experts, I think going into this, they could use something that our politicians could use, and that's humility, okay? We don't know. You cannot have this, what we're looking at, and say, I know what's gonna happen. You could say, I think this is gonna happen, this is a logical thing, I can tell you what I think that different candidates are gonna have to deal with, but let's face it, I know LSU's gonna put up a ton of points on Oklahoma. I don't know how many they're gonna put up on us, but we're gonna score. And I, you know, I, 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 I really don't know, but I, I, I am impressed with how engaged and how serious people are taking this whole enterprise. I really am. Well, I cannot thank both of you enough, and I, and I think what I would like to say on, the, on an end note is, once the president is elected, I do hope our country comes back together. Regardless of who it is, we cannot continue to stay at these odds. It, it, the chanting the ugly messages towards one part, calling the other part deplorables, um, at the end of the day, we're all Americans. And I, I certainly hope that if Trump prevails, maybe the Democrats can find solace in that these are the last four years they'll ever have to deal with him. If the Democrats prevail, Trump will be beat, and it's time to unite again behind our commander in chief. And certainly I want to thank both of my fabulous panelists who uh, make my job awfully easy. Thank you so much to Secretary Baker and the Baker Institute. Yeah.